This episode of Plastic Weekly is brought to you by John Johnson and the rest of my Patreon supporters who help make this show by donating a dollar to each week. John, thanks a million for listening and supporting me every single week. I hope you and I will get a chance to chat again soon. Today's episode is the second in the dullest podcast series ever, talking about hold-making materials. If you don't know who Will Anglin is, you've probably seen his products at your local gym, or at the very least, you've come across some strong guy wearing his t-shirts. Will is part of the trio behind Tension Climbing, the company at the forefront of North American wooden holds and training gear. This episode has been in the bank for a while. It was recorded back at the beginning of August, a few hours before he had to get some stitches taken out, so... Uh, account for that when you're thinking about the time. But otherwise, here's my interview with Will Anglin. Will Anglin, how you doing, man? Doing pretty well. How's it going? I'm doing great. You still have like stitches in your hands, right? Or what uh, What have you been going through lately? Well, uh, I have, well, I used to have carpal tunnel. Uh, I've had symptoms for like, 10 years or so and was able to manage it and then the past year I guess it's been getting a lot worse and then it started to affect my climbing which was not cool uh, and so I went ahead and had the carpal tunnel surgery so now my carpal tunnels are giant and I have not had any issues since but I got to get my stitches out today uh, and hopefully get back to climbing before too long, before my arms shrink any more than they already have. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope you, uh, I hope you have a quick recovery. We're going to talk you. about wood today because you're kind of like the go-to guy when it comes to uh, wooden holds in North America right now. Um, but that said, you're not the first guy to work with wood making climbing holds. Uh, so you've been climbing for a while before you started making wooden holds. What did you think of wood as like a hold material? Did you ever get a chance to climb on wood holds back when you were competing or when you were younger? Well, so that's, that's the interesting thing about wood holds is it's, it's not new at all. In fact, it's probably, uh, as old as it gets when it comes to climbing holds. Um, people have been climbing on, on wood holds and just screwing pieces of two by fours to walls for ever. Um, and before I started making them, it was always something that I would see typically like in the UK, I think they pretty much have been making wood holds, uh, in a more, as far as like businesses making wood holds and not just people throwing together scrap, uh, on home walls. Uh, I, I remember seeing stuff coming out of Europe and being like, man, I would love to climb on that. Um, I've always had skin issues and, um, you know, plastic is so rough and everything. And uh, eventually I, I just started making my own, uh, but I would make them by hand and it was super tedious and I didn't have the right tools. And I was basically just using like heavy metal rasps and it would take like, four hours a hold to get them the way that I wanted to. And so I only ever really made a handful. Um, and I put them up on a, a system board at, at my home gym and, and loved it and just always wished I had more. And it, it took, it took years after that. I think I was in high school and, uh, to finally get to actually starting a company, uh, around making what holds, Mostly just out of frustration of not being able to to get them. <laughs> okay, cool. So my next question was kind of like, did you want to make holds and you happen to have access to wood technology, so you went with wood, or were you really attracted to wood and you wanted to 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 do wood as a uh, as a, as like a, a company idea? So you were when you started tension climbing, the intent was like, hey, we want to do wood holds, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. It was kind of wood holds from the beginning. Um, I mean, I, I shaped plastic holds before I got into the wood holds. I've been shaping for kilter for a couple of years. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I wanted, I wanted to climb on wood holds and, uh, after trying to get wood holds from overseas and just kind of dealing with all that, it was like, man, you know, no one over here is really 
doing this in in a scalable way uh, to where they can make a bunch of holds at the same time. Uh, let's figure out how to do that. So really quickly, what makes wood so attractive for you to climb on? Man, a uh, lot of reasons. Uh, so first and kind of most obviously just the the skin portion of the argument, being able to train and not only just not wear your skin off, but be growing skin throughout the week while you're training. Uh, I mostly only get to go climbing uh, outside like one or two days a week, which is way better than what it used to be. I used to live on the East Coast in Maryland, and it, I would get to go on like two trips a year. But uh, So I can't complain that much, but I do feel like I have to train a lot in order to keep my strength up and be able to perform the way that I want to perform outside. And I found that when I was training at the kind of volume and intensity that I needed to on plastic, I would always show up on the weekend to my project just with my fingers thrashed and uh, not really be able to do what I wanted to do just because I would bleed two goes in. Uh, and that was not very fun. And so uh, with the wood, I'm able to train as hard as I want to all week and not have to worry about whether or not I'm going to show up to my project with the skin that I need. It more just kind of takes that out of the equation and I can focus on everything else like showing up rested and, and strong and ready to go. Um, so, so for the skin, uh, that's huge. Something else that I've noticed as I've climbed more and more on wood exclusively, um, because it, initially I was, I'd always thought like, oh, you know, wood is great, but it's going to need to be supplemented by plastic for a number of reasons. Uh, but as I climbed more and more on it, I gravitated more and more towards just climbing on the wood holds on my board. And then I was like, well, then let's just put all wood holds on the board and not even, not even worry about the plastic. Uh, and what I found is the way that you climb on wood holds is very different than plastic. Uh, so from an accuracy standpoint, uh, you have to arrive at the hold with a lot more precision and you've already got to be gripping the hold like as soon as you hit it. So you get this really precise, aggressive style that you have to learn how to climb with in order to really be able to do, uh, a lot of the harder moves and I found that that style in particular started to find its way into my my outdoor climbing and be really really helpful uh, on you know everything that I was climbing on so even just from a, a movement standpoint inherently the wood makes you do and climb in a certain way that I never really felt like I got on plastic that's really cool. Um, talking about the holds themselves now and the process you've gone through in making these things, uh, the only one I've ever known was, you know, Metolius made, you know, a few wood grips and they made theirs out of alder wood. When you started creating tension climbing, what process did you go through of choosing what woods you were going to work with and why did you go with some and not others? Yeah, so really good question. And that is something that we still kind of toil over and tweak and try and figure out exactly what's going to be best. Uh, each wood type has, you know, a certain level of machine ability or workability, like how easy it is for, uh, in, in our case, a CNC machine to cut, or uh, if you're working on them by hand, uh, each type of wood is going to be, ha have a certain amount of strength inherent in that type of wood. And the grain on each type of wood is very different. And what we found is the chalk interacts with the grain of the wood in different ways, depending on the type of wood that you use. So the way that we arrived at the woods that we use now is based on the strength needs from the shape of the hold. Like if it's, if it's thinner and more in cut, then we go 
Uh, right now we're using maple or walnut because it's a lot stronger. And then uh, as we get more towards holds where we aren't super worried about the strength, we're able to prioritize like the feel and the grain a little bit more. And that's typically where we use the poplar and the cherry because they, you know, for whatever reason, just, you know, based on our testing, they get a lot tackier with chalk and they just feel really good where the, like the maple is the slickest. Um, but because we're mostly using it on the in cuts where we need the strength, you don't, notice so much um and then on the flatter kind of slopier holds we go more towards the uh poplar and the cherry because because of that kind of texture that the grain gives it cool so you guys were producing using a, a cnc machine so before the cnc cuts uh, these holds down you have to have given it computerized instructions i guess you're putting in basically a 3d model uh, into the system and then it cuts it down to that. That's how that works. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much that we'll, so because we're using specific tools and some of them are, are custom like that we've, uh, designed and had a, a shop make for us. Um, at, so Ben does most of the, pretty much all of the programming tension is three people. It's me, Gabe Adams and Ben Spanith. And so, Ben does the CNC programming and he's got the tools basically memorized. And so he has a specific way that he can program it. That's pretty fast and efficient. He doesn't necessarily have to 3d model every single hold. Okay. Uh, but sometimes we do that, uh, if we're working on something new or trying to get a feel for something before we actually, uh, cut it out of wood or if we need to 3d print it or something like that are most of your prototypes made from the cnc machine and you feel them up and then you edit it from there or do you do you kind of have an idea of like okay i want you know i want an in cut rounded rail that's you know about a pad and a half do you shape it in some other form to try and feel it before you send it cnc or is it just cnc iterations over and over well the the wood some woods we can get pretty cheap and we'll We'll, sometimes we'll just prototype in uh, uh, just a cheaper wood. And for certain things, we'll, uh, we've used the 3D printer and we'll actually print out a version of like either an edge profile or something like that to see if it's something that we want to get like a custom tool made for or if it's even a good shape at all. Cool. Um, so you mentioned that you also shape plastic and you've shaped some really cool stuff from uh, kilter. Uh, your granite series in particular is, is like a really nice, it's, it's the kind of stuff I like. So I'll say a lot of good things about it. Cause I like, <laughs> you know, I like shapes that have a lot of intricacies where your fingers are going to feel a lot of different positions over, over a rail. I, I kind of, you know, I grew up in a gym that was predominantly like technic holds. Um, mm -hmm. so a more predictable finish, whereas the grandest stuff you're doing is, is really intricate. I, that's nice. Um, now you can obviously carve wood in any way you want, but would you ever be able to really like functionally produce wooden holds that started to take into account more intricate textures or, or, um, uh, more complicated shapes than the kind of training shapes you're building right now? Yeah. So that's the, the kicker there is, can, can you produce it? efficiently because i know uh, for sure you can take a dremel to wood and and kind of reproduce what you're doing on a one-off setting but how do you do that uh in a mass production kind of way yeah and that's and that's really what we're we're looking of course you can hand make things and get them however you want them but now but then you're talking like the man hours that are involved in that and being able to produce something like that to scale and it's not super feasible at the moment, um, but we're definitely pursuing certain options that in the future our, our holds will get you know, more and more refined and we'll be able to handle more complex shapes as we're able to kind of update the tools and the machines that we're working with. But I don't think there's, the thing 
the difference between one of the main differences between uh, plastic and wood, as far as like hold size and complexity and everything, um, plastic is really great because you can hollow back it. And so at certain sizes, you're able to reduce the amount of material material that you're using by a lot. Um, with wood, you kind of can't do that in a really feasible way. You could hollow back it, but then you're turning all the material that was inside of it to dust, so you're not really saving anything. You you could make the hold lighter, but you still paid you know forty dollars for that giant hunk of wood, um, and then you're putting all this work into it, and no one wants to buy a you know two foot long hold for three hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so, like I I was I was confused what you're going to say, but that's really interesting that you can functionally make the same kind of product and that it's lighter, even at a big size. But I totally didn't think about how you guys don't get to benefit from the material savings. That's super interesting. Yeah. So there's there's kind of magic sizes for different materials where you're really optimizing what you're getting out of the raw material put in. And so a lot of our holds at this point are really focused on creating a really functional shape at a price that is not completely outrageous. Um, and you know, you, even with plastic, um, and working with plastic, you run into those similar sizes too, where like a certain massive hold is like right past the edge where you can get the hollow back, but it's still small enough where you can fit X number of holds within one silicon mold. And so you're really optimizing the use of materials there and you're able to do more with less. Um, and so we're still figuring out the best way to kind of work with more and less material um, and trying to keep that price point somewhere where, you know, you're not having to like, you know, because it's still capitalism. <laughs> no, like people aren't gonna. It doesn't matter how cool the hold is if it's if it's ten times more than a, a plastic equivalent, then no one's gonna buy it. So um, it sounds like you're saying that like wood holds are kind of inherently more expensive than plastic holds will be. Um, at, at certain sizes, for sure. Can at you give us a breakdown of like where those costs come from? Like you're you're kind of talking about the cost of wood, but if you like, I don't know what a standard like if you buy a, a a plank or I don't know how big a block of wood is, but can you give us an idea of how much you might be paying for the raw materials? Uh, yeah, to a certain extent, it kind of depends uh, a lot on how much you're getting. So there are certain price breaks at certain volumes, but there's also there. You know, they're being made out of trees and trees only grow so thick or so wide or something like that. So you don't always get to just go in and say, oh, I want a board that is, you know, X long and X wide and X thick. And like, I'm always going to get that because some trees just don't grow that wide and some trees don't grow that tall or whatever. So um, and that that's another thing that's like very different than plastic. Plastic is just plastic. But um so for a really thick like long board i mean you could be one board could cost over a hundred dollars um of just raw material and then depending on the shape that you're cutting out of it you you know you may get a good margin on that or you may not at all um and running the cnc machine like that's an expensive machine um and it breaks sometimes, sometimes we break it <laughs> and then we have to get it repaired. And there's definitely a lot that goes into it. Um, and yeah, we're definitely, we're still working on, we're still working on our margins, but we're, we're hoping that and kind of banking on the fact that we're going to be able to, uh, get everything more efficient here, um, in the future. But what's they don't the, have any like super hard numbers. Yeah, what's your production rate like right now? Like if you guys are going full steam for a day, um, how many holds can you pump out with your current system? If we're if we're going full steam and nothing goes wrong, uh, <laughs> <laughs> then we can probably do 
depending on the hold, like three to six hundred a day. Okay, wow, that's actually a lot, man. Yeah, it's it the the trick is managing every like all the different types of holds that we have because that's how much we could do if we like you're just working on one single hold type and uh yeah and nothing goes wrong you don't have to like stop the machine at all and everything just runs smoothly um that's that's when you could hit like three to six hundred of, of a one hold type uh per day but as soon as you are switching to a different type of hold um you know you're setting up the machine a different way and different stocks going in and it's um and it's a whole thing hmm. uh, but as demand gets higher we can we could up that uh also um uh, talking about like demand and and how much the market wants what holds there's so there's clear benefits anybody that you know considers himself serious about training probably wants to use wood tools um you know whether it's just a hangboard or you know a system wall made of wood out of, out of tension stuff um everybody knows that wood has has a lot of uh plus sides for training but then again it, it's kind of more expensive at the moment uh you work in a, in a modern, typical climbing gym where you guys support rope climbing and bouldering and you have a youth team and you've got, you know, lots of adults and you're also in an area that supports a lot of uh, outdoor climbing and alpinism. So you, you are kind of really familiar with what modern climbing is and what a modern climbing gym does. Uh, where do you think, like, how far can wood materials infiltrate a place like your gym, uh, Earth Treks Golden, uh, you know what's the where does it max out is it every gym has a project wall that's all wood holds um and uh uh you know a training area with hangboards and all that kind of stuff or can you take it further or do you think a lot of gyms will never end up you know buying all the wood stuff that you guys make well um really good question uh for well one i don't actually work at the gym anymore because i've been able to go uh full time over at tension, which is Damn, very exciting. Nice job, me. man. That's right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, really good question. And I think it's going to be kind of a growing experience for everybody. Um, I think there are certain preconceived notions about wood holds that are still in the process of kind of being broken down. Um, one of those being that it's purely just for like you know people who are hardcore into training and are climbing really hard and really and and what we tried to do with our system board layout is you know really make it accessible to all levels like if you climb v2 to v13 you can climb on this board and have more problems than you know what to do with um it's not just a really a kind of elite level thing. And I think that's something that um, people are still learning or kind of realizing because it has been like you, you see just like these old kind of dingy boards in people's basements and they're just – shredded and pulling yeah, on I, th I think people when crimps. they think of like the tension board arrangement they still probably think of it as an analog to the moon board right and the moon board has this reputation as a, a super high level training tool yes exactly and it's and it's not that it, it can't be that i mean we you know we all train on it um we have people who climb you know 8c boulders who train on the board too um but also you know everyone else who comes over and climbs who doesn't climb that difficult and they're climbing you know v2 v3 boulders there's still plenty of stuff to do um and something that we've kind of tried to to do to help people realize that a little bit more um just about wood holds inherently is we've set uh wooden just boulder problems down in the main floor of the gym and i think they set a wooden sport route too uh it's really it's just it's just another hold material it doesn't necessarily have to be reserved for you know super hardcore climbers or whatever you want to call them uh, it's really something that everyone can enjoy and i'm hoping eventually that uh 
it starts to find its way out of the training area exclusively. Um, and, you know, wood can be, everyone's kind of gone to, you know, single color, uh, hold setting. Wood can be a color, uh, actually out in a main bouldering area. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> yeah. So you, uh, like right now, everybody's on a super, well, not, I shouldn't say everybody, but you know, newer gyms, especially when they're coming in with a brand new hold budget, everybody's going monochromatic. So you're following single colors as you climb. Um, and that's something that, you know, I'm, I, there's ways to obviously paint wood and all that kind of stuff. It's probably not ideal in terms of texture. It probably won't look the same, mm -hmm. like straight up yellow plastic isn't going to look like yellow wood. Do you, probably can't make those things jive perfectly especially if you're one of those root setters that's like super super picky about the difference between yellow and yellow um but when you get into finishes you guys uh first of all the different woods you use have slightly different colors uh have you played around with getting into different finishes so you can bring out some different colors or or stain them so that you can get you know darker and lighter uh finishes just from a cosmetic standpoint yeah, so we've messed with it a little bit. From a route setting perspective, um, I mean, I'm def I, I love wood holds, but I'm also not a total crazy person. Like, I realize <laughs> that it's, it, you know, at, if it is able to, if people are, are willing to accept it and then it's able to make its way into, like, you know, out of the training area, um, I don't think we're going to see, you know, a problem density with wood holds within a facility where you're going to need, you know, this is yellow wood and then this is blue wood <laughs> like right next to each yeah. other. It's going to, you know, there, there might be like a wood circuit in the gym of, you know, 10 to 25 problems depending on the, the gym size. Um, so from a route setting standpoint, I don't think changing the color of the wood is necessary. Um, as far as just in general, you know, staining or finishing the wood in some way. Uh, we, tr we've tried a number of different things and honestly, none of it feels as good as just the raw wood feels really. Okay. Um, yeah. And so we kind of just stopped playing with it. Um, and man, the wood is pretty, uh, we use good wood. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's really nice, you know, and I, I think just kind of the, aesthetic of the you know the walnut and the cherry and the poplar and the maple here and there uh i think that in itself is just really aesthetic the uh the last thing i want to talk about um is uh right now if you find wood in a gym it's probably going to be in the training room or it's going to be the volumes on the wall right um you guys aren't currently doing volume stuff maybe you guys will eventually uh, but the one other area of woodworking that, that, um, and I'm, I'm not sure if it's applicable, but you know, as a, this is super stupid, but, uh, like canoe making, uh, and all these kind of wood techniques that I clearly don't understand. Uh, but when you start taking wood and wood laminates, uh, and start bending these things and molding them or shaping them so that they start to take curves and things like that, it's kind of, you know, in my mind, I hope that there's, uh, uh, an application for that where it can be something like volumes or feature size holds that are still relatively light and strong, but can take on more natural, uh, curves and things like that. Have you seen anybody working with, with that technology or any other kind of ideas with wood that take the same material, but, you know, manufacture and interpret it in a different way than just the carving techniques? Well, there's, um, I believe they're out of Japan. Um, uh, you know, I'm not even going to, I, I think I know the name of the volume <laughs> company, but I'm not going to guess and make myself sound like Yo, more I can of an edit idiot. It out. I can edit um, it out. But they're, uh, they, similar to, as you were just saying, like canoe building, they're, they're building this kind of frame and bending, uh, thin ply around it to create like large, you know, like hemisphere type volumes, uh, that are wood. Um, and I know, uh, uh, woodpecker does a very similar thing also, okay. um, with more kind of volume type, uh, shapes where yeah it's not necessarily like you're getting like a stock piece of wood and they're cutting it out they're actually like bending laminate and uh 
and doing like glue ups and, and things like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's kind of the next logical place to go is incorporating more advanced woodworking techniques uh, into that kind of hold production. But the, the trick there, again, is going to be if you can scale it and have it not be super expensive because yeah. so some of those techniques are – you know, really impressive and, and really take, uh, like a craftsman to do correctly mm-hmm. and to be able to churn out enough quantity to make that worth it. I think that's going to be the, uh, the sticking point there, but I don't think that that is insurmountable. You no. know, I think, I think we'll see that. Uh, it's just, it's just only a matter of time. Yeah. Well, I, you know, you see, you know, vertical solutions for so long has been using wood as their like primary, like visual identity for, for years. And mm-hmm. now Waltopia and Rockworks are, are using wood finishes as well on some of the walls. And it's, it's clearly something that people are like, oh, this is kind of a popular idea. And like somewhere on earth, there's got to be some rich guy who wants to build a bouldering gym or something. And he's probably like in Portland, Oregon, super hip, just wants like an all wood <laughs> gym, just willing to pay anything for just, you know, artisan woods and stuff like that and, and get some of your stuff and, and get some of the... Uh, you'll have to tell me the name of the the Japanese company you're thinking of, and if we can find it, I'll link it in the uh, in the I, description. I think it's under Bluehold. Okay, I'm I'll check that out. I've seen that totally name. I've seen sure. that in Simple, I think, but I can't remember where they're from. Um, I've just yeah, seen Simple. It. Simple is out of Europe. They're doing really okay. cool things with dual texture volumes that. I just can't get over shit. two color volumes. Like that's gonna kill me, man. Uh, oh yeah, that breaks me. <laughs> But see, I don't think they. I don't think they. Ha- I think that's a. Yeah, that's a, probably optional, right? Visual choice. Yeah, yeah, on on their part. Um, I you know I think if you wanted them one color, I'm sure they, they would make them. Uh, yeah. but yeah, the dual texture and volumes. That's yeah. like a whole nother conversation. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm so psyched for dual text. I, 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 I'm, I, I'm almost mad that there isn't more demand for squeezing on. Uh, on smooth plastic right now. I feel like that's definitely kind of in a couple of years, we'll be dealing with problems where you're, where you're just squeezing slick plastic and that's the only way to get separation kind of thing. We'll have to see, but, uh, yeah. Um, thanks a lot for taking time to talk to me about wood. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and, uh, and I know you're going to the hospital this afternoon to, to finish up your hands. I hope that goes well. And, uh, I know for sure I'll talk to you in the future. Uh, but for now, best of luck with the hands and everything at tension and, uh, and we'll talk to you soon. Well, thanks. Great. Thanks, Tyler. That's it for this week's episode of Plastic Weekly. Thanks to Will Anglin for answering my questions, and thanks to you guys for listening. Plastic Weekly is presented and produced by me, Tyler Norton. If you liked this episode, please leave a review in your podcast app or consider donating a dollar or two each week to my Patreon at patreon.com slash plasticweekly. It helps me start to pay back the equipment costs of this project and I'll thank you on the show or maybe even send you some stickers. Make sure you visit plasticweekly.com to find footnotes, references, and other bonus content related to our episodes. Or if you're a new listener, it's a place where you can listen to all of our past episodes and check out the show notes. If you want to get in touch with me, you can leave a comment at plasticweekly.com and you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can send me an email to tyler at plasticweekly.com with your comments, concerns, questions, compliments. Just tell me you're out there somewhere. Good luck to everyone competing this weekend, including at locals in BC and across the States, as well as at the Youth Pan Am Championships in Montreal. We'll be thinking about you. Talk to you next week. (laughs) 